Hello, uh, most of you know me, I am Professor Hector Puga. I'm going to teach this course, and this course, uh, the name may be a little bit uh, misleading, but this course is about power system dynamics, yeah? So we will discuss um, what is the, the, the special characteristic of the power system in a dynamic state? You know, what are the things that we, we would like to improve in the power system, yeah? Have you taken any dynamic course so far? Anything that is dynamic? What is the what? transients in circuit one? Transient in circuit one. What else? I'm sure that you took took some uh, courses from control. Did you signal analysis? Yeah, yeah. You, you study some of that there. So, how would you define a dynamic system? When, when do we say that something is has a dynamic behavior and when it does not? Like when it's changing. What is changing? Like, it, like the load is changing constantly. All right, okay. So if we have changes over time, then that might have a dynamic behavior. Yeah. Um, would this then would have a dynamic behavior? Yes? Yeah. So any dynamical system from the mathematical point of view can be uh, described as a system in which we have at least one component that can store energy. And the energy, we know that the energy is something you cannot change instantaneously. It takes some time to consume energy or to absorb energy from some other components. So for example, if you're driving your car, you're in the highway and you're going at, let's say we're a good citizen, we're at 65 miles per hour in the highway, but you see that there is an accident in, in front of you, you use the brake uh, pedal. And what happened? Can you stop the speed immediately? No, because it's a dynamic system. You have energy, kinetic energy in the car, and it will take us some time to develop that action you have been taking. What is the action? You're using the, the brake, you're, you're, you're braking the car. So it will take some seconds until that energy is converted into something else. What is the conversion of the kinetic energy there? The kinetic energy is converted into heat, thermal energy. So there is a conversion and that takes time. Um, but if you have a system, you may have different type of energy stored. And that's a big difference in the power system because you, you can have a component that can store a lot of energy and a little bit of energy. And when you compare those two, you see, you see that there is a big difference. For example, the same exercise with the car, you're driving your car, but at the same time next to you in the highway, there is a, 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 a track and there is a train passing by. And let's say that both use the brake to stop. Which one do you think will take longer to stop? The train, why? Because of the mass, because of the energy storing the train is way much larger than the car. So if we compare those two situations, if, if we are paying attention to the train, we will say that the energy storing the car is not much. And actually we can even say something further. We can say that the speed of the car was changed almost instantaneously if we compare that with the action in the train. Maybe in the train, it, it will take maybe a minute to stop. In the car, it just took just a few seconds, right? Both are systems that store energy, but by comparison, it seems the car can stop instantaneously if I compare that with the car, with the train. So that's what we're going to study in the power system. And you have components that can store energy. Which one? Big power plants. These are huge masses that are rotating in a shaft. And they can store a lot of kinetic energy. Any change that they will have, it will take time to develop. At the same time, you have in the system, you have other components that store energy, that store little energy. For example, Transmission line, they have an inductance, inductive behavior. 
can be stored energy, yes, in the form of carbon. Because they have an induction, the carbon that goes through the lines cannot change instantaneously, but the amount of energy they store is tiny. From the point of view of the whole system, if you look at these two components of storing energy, which one is the one that is going to remain in time? The one associated with these heavy masses in the, in the generator. So if we look at the same thing, if that is the most important thing, we will look at the transmission line and we'll see that the behavior in the transmission line is almost instantaneous. So that's what we're going to study in this course how we can re represent the power grid considering all these different storage components that can store energy. And some of them are going to be fast and we will have a specific representation for that. Other are slow or involve a lot of energy. And those are going to be the most critical to make sure that the system is stable and remain functional. What are the most drastic behavior that we can expect in the power system? What do you think? Blackout? What, what can lead to a blackout? An outage in the generator? Why we're going to have an outage? Yeah. Okay. A failure? A fault? Yeah. Unexpected. What else? Another failure for some reason. For some reason, catch on fire. Maybe a part of the system will be disconnected and the system will respond to that. The question will respond in a stable way. Are we still safe? Can the system handle that or not? So those, those are the things we're interested in. Here. Uh, then the other one has to do with weather induced failure, the storm, tornado, those things can also impact the system. But most importantly, human error, human error in the operation, maybe, or accident, you know, those can lead also to big failures in the system. Well, that's a short description of what we're going to study. Yeah. And here I have the syllabus for you. And I put this in, in Canvas already. Um, some of you have been with me, so the style of the classes are not going to be any different. What is important in my classes? Uh, interaction. I want to talk to you, and I want you to participate because that will lead what we're going to discover during the semester. Based on your question, then maybe we can emphasize on some aspects, depending on your interest. If, if you don't participate much, then it will be kind of my, what I have in mind, and it might be boring for you. But you have some control on this. Participate, ask questions, and we can have a good semester. Um, so I'm going to use the slide, but also I'm going to use a whiteboard to uh, work on examples or give explanation. And we will have quizzes and those that have been with me before know about the quizzes. These are simple questions. Hopefully all of you get it right. And, and because it has a minimum percentage of the final grade is going to be related to quizzes, I grade it in a discrete fashion, 0, 55, or 100. So if you get the answer kind of right, you will get 100. If you're not that clear in your answer, not, not a little bit, big part you're not clear, then you're going to get 55. If you're not even close, you will get zero. So what is the purpose of the quiz? Just feedback for you to see if, whether you're following or not. If you're getting zeros and 55, that's a alarm, alert. Hey, something needs to be different. And what can be? Maybe you need to talk more to me or ask for clarification. That might be one. Um, or maybe you need to work in a different way during this, the week. You know, you need to figure that out. But that's going to be uh, feedback for you to see how you're doing. The, the, the specific thing we will talk are here in this list. So today we're going to have an a, a introduction to the power system. 
And then we will start talking about dynamic system. Linear system, that's something that probably you study in signals and maybe, I don't know the name, uh, a control system. Do you take control system? Or you're taking that now maybe? No? Uh, it's a senior elective, but- Elective, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so, so okay. But signal, pro, you, you took, all of you took signal. So we will talk about linear systems, something that you study in signal, but then we will discuss how this uh, aspect of linear system can be applied to nonlinear system. Why nonlinear system? Because the power system is nonlinear and we need to know how to handle that issue. Um, then we will talk about numerical integration techniques Basically, all the models we're going to consider to represent the dynamic behavior of the system involve differential equations. So how we solve differential equations, and we will discuss about the numerical integration techniques. That's the first part, kind of general and mathematical, but then in chapter five and forward, we will apply this to power system. So we will talk about synchronous machine, we will discuss the different models that we use today, but we will focus on a very simple one so we can work and apply the, the, the theory we're going to study. Yeah. And then we will talk about some three problems, main problems that we might find in power system. Chapter six, power oscillations. You know that the power system will respond most of the time with oscillation if there is a failure some problem in the system. The system will move to a new equilibrium point, but typically will oscillate. We will study that problem there. Another is frequency control. And you mentioned changes in the load. When the load changes, then we need to change the generated power from our power plant. So, and we need to match whatever power is being consumed. But how we do that, we don't, do it by looking at the power, but by looking at the frequency. If we are able to keep the frequency at 60 Hertz all the time, it's because whatever is being demanded is being produced by our generators. So we indirectly, by looking, controlling the frequency, we will control the power balance. How much is being generated, how much is being demanded need to be equal. So we will do that by controlling the frequency. Chapter eight, we will discuss a voltage control, mainly the work that we do at the power plants. We control reactive power to control voltages. And finally, we will talk about renewable energy. I believe that we will talk mainly about wind turbines, which is the leading non-conventional renewable energy we have in the country. Is today is more important than hydropower. In the past, hydropower was the most important renewable energy source. Today is wind power, wind power. And the percentage of the total installed capacity is more than 10%. So it's, it's and, and the, the trend indicates that this will keep increasing in the future. So that's important that we take a look at that. So how this is going to be evaluated? We have a final exam, 30% of the final grade. And here's the date, Monday, May 15, from 1 to 3.15 on this room. Yeah. Uh, then we have two midterm exams, and here are the tentative dates, February 24th and April 5th. We will have homework assignment that might be related with some chapters, and I, I think we will have like four homeworks assignment, yeah? And, and the quizzes that are going to be on Monday after the class, and you will have until midnight to answer. Anytime you, you, you have available after class, you will go to Canvas and answer the quiz, yeah? So these are, this, this is going to, it's going to be at your own pace. You should take like five minutes to answer the quiz, but it's at your own pay. If you wanna take more, that's, that's fine. And you have until midnight to answer. Not all Monday. And I think probably, I don't know if I put it in the syllabus, but uh, 
please, uh, I, I don't, maybe here in the first page. Uh, yeah, between eight and 10 quizzes. So not every Monday. Some Monday we, we may not have quizzes. Okay. Um, the final grade then using these percentages will be determined based on these uh, rules. If your grade is between these uh, ranges, then you will have a corresponding grade. Yeah. And for those of you that have not been with me before, uh, if I observe that in the midterm exam or final exam, I see that the majority of you did not perform well in one particular problem, I will scale the test. You know, uh, if I see that some of you, the majority are doing well, that's fine. That's how it's supposed to be. But if if I feel that the majority did not do well in one problem, probably that's my fault and something was not explained well. So I will scale the, the, the test. Yeah. Any question? No? Yeah. This uh, course, uh, so far we don't have a TA. There are some department rules that we need to have a minimum number of students to have a TA. So, so far we don't have a TA and that makes things more difficult. So if you know somebody that is thinking about taking this course, maybe you can help by encouraging them to register this course. If we have uh, two or more students that can be added to this uh, course, I might be able to get a TA for this class, yeah? So can you help me? Do you know anybody maybe that is thinking about this? And yeah, if that is the case, I, I will I will talk to the department head and see if I, I can get a TA for this class. Yeah. Any question? Question? No? Yeah, that's the syllabus. <clears throat> um, we will talk about the power system in general. So some of these slides come from 325 as well, but I'm focusing on the dynamic aspect now. So <clears throat> typically, you know, to describe the power system energy flow, we use this type of diagram, Sankey diagram. And basically we will use an arrow that indicate from where to where the energy is flowing, but also the width of these arrows will be proportional to the amount of energy that is flowing between those two points. And here's an example. So if you have a, a power plant, then you will have all the incoming in the input, which is called is going to be a hundred units, whatever this is, or you can talk in terms of percent. But um, because this is a thermal process, 70% of this is lost. It's energy that is lost in heat, heat that we cannot recover, just go to the atmosphere and we just lost that energy. So 70% is lost. We use 30% uh, roughly speaking in terms of power, the electrical power that we can extract from this 100 is about 30%. But then that 30% of the total energy that you have uh, in terms of coal, then that 30% will be lost until you arrive to the final point. For example, you will lose like 90% in terms of transmission and distribution of this power because the electrical power needs to go through the transmission line and then through the distribution network to finally arrive to the customer. So we will have that uh, loss. So, so you will have like 21% of this total power coming <coughs> at the point of connection with your consumption. But then if you look inside of your uh, system, whatever you have, you are con connecting to the grid, then you might have internal losses as well. So you might have, uh, you're, you might not be 100% efficient in whatever process you have. Um, and these losses can be electrical or can be mechanical or other type of losses as you can see. So at the end, what we recover sometimes is a small fraction of what is being produced um, at the power plant. Well, that's an example, but this is realistic. 
So this is what happened in 2019 in the country. This kind of describe how the energy uh, was flowing that year from the primary en energy sources to the power system and to the final consumption in residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation areas. Um, also, at the same time, you can see how much of, of all this energy has been actually consumed for useful work and how much of that energy has been projected in terms of heat that we couldn't recover. So the energy is still close to 70%. So we're not very far away from what happened in a thermal system. We are moving in that direction. Maybe with more renewable, things will be different. But so far, we are still there. So probably we'll need to, we, we need to have like 10 more years maybe to see a significant change here. Yeah? But we are still in around the 70% of rejected energy. Uh, in regard to the power system, you see that uh, still a big fraction of this, I would say less than 30 percent. Uh, we can calculate the numbers. Here you have the, the energy here is measuring quads. So you have 10.2 quads, but you can sum all of them and, and see how much input you're having here and how much these correspond to the total amount. But uh, this amount is going to be sent to the power system. As you can see, coal is used mainly in the power system, and some of this is, is used uh, in the industrial sector directly. But uh, in the past, in the past, power systems suffered a lot because of pollution. And the main reason for that, it was coal. Around 50% of this was produced by coal power plant, which was very negative uh, in regards to the health of the population. But that is going down now, mainly because we have natural gas now, but also because we have these renewable sources. So in the past, we have hydro that was the most significant renewable energy source, but today we have wind. This is 2019. Now we're, we just finished 2022. So this number is a little bit much larger than hydro. So the last time that I checked this, wind has more than 10% of the total installed capacity in the system was from wind. Yeah? Um, so that's what we can observe. Uh, there is also discussion about the impact on the transportation. So this uh, is something that uh, can change now because we have electrical vehicles. So the energy for the transportation, some part of these will come to the transportation system and hopefully this will be reduced, also helping to be more uh, concerned for the environment when reducing this rejected energy. What is the main impact of this rejected energy? Global warming, global warming. So that's uh, 2019. Then we have 2018. Can you see some different there? So probably more coal here. You know, but you can look at the numbers uh, carefully and see what, what are the main difference. And this is a big difference. Look, 2010, coal there is around 50% of the total input in the power system, almost 50% uh, was generated by coal power plant. So things have changed over the years. And maybe in 10 years more, this will be very different. How this is started? Well, more than a century ago, this was the picture of the el electricity development in the country. So you have some uh, isolated electrical system developed in some big cities. So the red are the AC system, and the yellow the C system. So we have Edison and, and Tesla fighting for, for the development of the, the power system. But uh, today, most of this is based on AC system, AC signal. And there are some applications in which uh, 
we would like to use the C signal because the C signal, for example, can be very attractive when you're transmitting large volume of energy over long distances. Then you can use DC because it's going to be more efficient, yeah, and more effective as well. It's very reliable to transmit large volume of power over long distance. DC is, is the way to go. As you can see, the grid is very uh, well connected. There are millions and millions of components. Here we have power plants, transformer, transmission lines, load, energy storage, and many other components. And this is one of the most uh, complicated and largest network that humankind has produced. The same thing happened in Europe with a small development in cities of the electrical system for those cities. Some took the AC development, other took the DC, but at the end then we have a big interconnected network based on AC system. Power generation. So the power generation can be a sketch for the thermal power plant basically by this scheme. What is at the heart of the power plant is the generator. In the generator, basically what we need is mechanical power. We need some source that can create some motion movement inside that, that generator. How we can create that motion? It doesn't matter. Let's find a, a source, a mechanical source that can provide that. And the, the most important one was coal power plant. So what this, did they do? Well, we take coal, we burn the coal, create heat, and with that water was converted into steam, high pressure, high temperature, and that steam was sent through a turbine. The turbine, when passes through the blade of the turbine, create the motion and convert that a chemical energy into mechanical energy. And finally, in the generator, that mechanical energy was converted into electricity. So you saw me coming with this. Um, this is a very uh, rustic uh, generator that I created. So here you have a shaft. I glue, no, <laughs> it's not very pretty, but I glue permanent magnet here, and I put them in this bearing system. So this can rotate freely. What I put next to this, I put a coil. Basically, by Faraday's law, if I change the flux that go in and out of this coil, and that's what I'm going to create with this rotation. If this is north and this is south, when this is rotating, sometimes south will go inside the, the, the coil, sometimes nothing, sometimes north. And, and the flux will go in and out, in and out that coil. That change, according to Faraday, will induce a voltage here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was going to bring the tester and didn't have batteries. I'm sorry, guys. But I will bring this on Wednesday and we will play with this a little bit. But as you will see on Wednesday and based on what I'm describing now, it's a very simple principle. The principle is simple. When, we, when it comes to generator, this is more complicated because we want to make it very efficient and effective. We want to create a perfect sinusoidal signal for voltage and current. Then the design gets tricky, but the principle is as simple as this. So we will work with this on Wednesday. So be prepared. Uh, in this case, the, the rotation came from the steam. But what about if that rotation can come from other sources? What would you think? Anything. Well, what do you think we can couple the shaft of that generator to what source to create rotation? Water. Water, water hydropower. So the water can go into that turbine. And there are two types of turbine. One that you can submerge into a flow. For example, here in the Tennessee River, I can go and put a foundation there and put a turbine that is submerged into the water. The flow will keep moving permanently and that will spin the turbine and that I will generate power. Is that the most if, if, if efficient way to produce hydropower? No, but that will work. Another way is to have dam 
a reservoir of water up high, and then I take a pipeline and I let the water fall. I need to fall and need to be an elevation, significant elevation. The larger the elevation, the more power you can get. So if you have that uh, uh, topo topographical characteristic, you have mountains, for example, then you can have a high elevation and produce a lot of power. That's the most important uh, uh, hydropower plant we can have today. What other source you can have? It's up to us, you know, in today, you know, we can be creative. Let's look around and see where we can get this source. If you can think and come up with a new way, maybe you in the future will develop a new way to develop energy. So another way, what did we talk? Wind turbines. Well, we have a different blade. We have a, a different flow. Now you have air flowing through the, the blades of the turbine. It will spin and you can produce power. What is the main difference there in the wind turbine with steam turbine or hydro turbine? Have you ever seen a wind farm? Have you ever driven by a wind park? What have you seen? Big? Yeah. Okay, what else? Flow is not constant. Flow is not constant. What else? It takes a lot of them to produce like any significant energy. Like one doesn't produce that much. All right. We we have a need to in a wind farm, to have an equivalent power for, for a conventional power plant, you might have 200 wind turbines or more. Yes. So there are a lot of differences, but the source is there. So even though the principle is similar, probably the design, the engineering design needs to be different by what you said, 200 turbines. Another one that is important for wind is that the rotation of the plates is not important it's not it's, it is important it's not impressive when you see a wind farm you see how how come this turbine can produce any power you don't see them rotating much well that's the characteristic so in that case you need to couple a turbine that is rotating very slowly with a generator that is rotating much faster so you need to have some gear designed there that can speed up the rotation. So that's a particular engineering solution to that uh, type of generator. Well, what else can we do with this thermal uh, process? What is the thermal process? Basically water that is converting to steam and the steam goes through the turbine, which move the generator. How we can produce the steam? Well, you can use coal, but what about if you use uh, other type of energy, nuclear? With nuclear reaction, then you can produce heat and the heat will convert the water into steam. It's exactly the same process, it's just the source is different. Yeah. Um, and here you have other, other types. These may be a little bit different, natural gas, because with natural gas, you don't use it to produce water into steam, but you burn the gas in the Exhaustion, is that the pronunciation of exhaustion gases? Can you say that for me? Exhaust gases. Exhaust. Those come out at high pressure, high temperature, and those move the turbine. So that's a little bit different. Uh, today, also, we have a new type of renewable energy. How are we doing with time? Yeah. Um, which is uh, solar energy. One, one type of solar energy that can fit very well the thermal power plant is the one that has a field with collector of heat. So sometimes this can be like, look like an antenna that capture the radiation from the sun and send it to a place, a receiver. It's in the center of the field that are receiving the concentration of all the radiation from the sun is sent to that point. So that point can get really, really hot. Uh, and that can be used to produce steam. And then with the steam, you produce electricity. 
So the principle is very simple. Also because the sun, we, we will not have radiation at night where they had been exploring and there are some power plants in, 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 the, in the world that use this. They store energy in salt. So they have molten salt that can be uh, receive the heat and maintain the heat for several hours. So that same heat can be used later to produce steam at night, for example, and produce power. Hydro, as I said, you know, this is uh, the most typical one. You have a dam, and you have water, you have an elevation, so you have significant elevation. You need elevation to produce more power. So you let the water fall, and this will hit the turbine, and you will produce power. So the, the power output is proportional to the elevation. And this is a typical, uh, a well-known uh, hydropower plant we have in the country with 2000 megawatts of installed capacity. Uh, wind turbines, uh, we said that this can rotate slowly, but the power for wind turbines is going to be proportional to the square of the length of the blades. And that's why you can see the evolution in time. This is 1980, 85, 90, 2005, 2010, 2020. You see how this has been increasing in, in size. So if, if it's the, it was that easy, why we didn't go from 2000 to 2020 immediately and increase the size? What was the problem with that? Why we couldn't have a, a turbine of this size of this year? We're electrical engineers, but we need to understand other fields as well at least an idea, an intuition. Why do you think we couldn't go in 2000 and just build a turbine that is this size? Just don't scale up that fast, I guess. Why, why not? Uh, you need a proof concept that it will work on- Why might not work? Okay, maybe proof concept wasn't the right word, but like, uh, I guess you need to show investors that it would be worth it. I don't know. When is not going to be worth it? I think with the logistics of manufacturing and transporting such big components, you have to make yeah. a big blade, transport a big yeah. blade, and you have to have a lot of land to put a large structure like that. Issues with requiring that much land. Yeah, that's an important factor. But the main reason is the strength of the material. Do you have a material today that can be that long and resist all the torque and the forces that will be when you have it on the field of receiving wind? If the answer is no, these are going to get broken soon. The investment will go to the trash can. That's not a good project. So the limitation today is basically this material. Do we have a material that is strong and light enough to receive the forces and, and withstand the forces that we will have in a field where you have a significant airflow? If the answer is yes, yeah, let, let's do it. Let's increase it. But that's the limitation. Yeah. And we have another concern today with these turbines. And the concern is what do we do with these turbines when the, they are not useful anymore? when the wind turbine is not very efficient anymore and we need to replace it. So what they're doing these days, they're just dumping dump this somewhere. Uh, and that is a big negative impact for the environment. So that's a big problem today. If we think about increasing the penetration of wind turbines in the system, we might have an addition in the, in the future. We might pollute significantly the world with this, with waste. So the research today, and this is not our field in electrical engineering, mechanical, material science. The research is how we can build this with recyclable material. So that's the research is going in that direction. 
The system is a synchronized system. So it's large, as I show you in the picture at the beginning, but also is complex because it's a synchronized system. So synchronized system means that all the generator, the speed of this generator in the system will be proportional to each other. So if one starts speeding up faster than the rest, there will be some interaction and power flow between the machine. So that machine that was speeding up will be dragged down and be equal with the rest. So it's a very solid concept. The system is synchronized. There is no generator that can deviate from the other. All should have the same proportional speed, which is good. That's why we, we have this big network today in different continents, you know, and work very well. And that is the main uh, system that we have to distribute energy from generation to consumption. Um, but the new, the new technology doesn't work in that fashion. So for example, wind turbines, they're not, they don't use synchronous generators. So they use typically induction generators. So how, how that can impact the behavior of the system? What do you think might be an immediate impact? We wanna have the frequency constant because that has to do with the power balance. If the frequency is 60 Hertz, whatever is being consumed is being produced. It's an easy way to check it. If the frequency is more than 60 Hertz, it's because you're generating more power than is being consumed. If you have less, you're generating less than what is being consumed. So looking at the frequency is very easy. But uh, if the system is start like going into renewable energy with generators that do not, are not synchronous generator, that might be different. The frequency might change more. The system will not be as robust as we conceive the system today. So those are the changes we will expect. In this slide, I have some description of what is a synchronous generator and what is the meaning of that. Yeah, but it's basically what we're taught. And another slide related with the same thing, frequency is an in, indirect measure of a perfect balance between the consumption and the consumption you have load and losses. And that need to be equal to the generation. So if these are equal, the frequency will be 60 Hertz. And if you have some changes in the system and you're not able to balance this, generation is not equal to the consumption, then we will have a problem, which is a blackout. That happened in 2003, when more than 50 million people were without electricity on August 14, 2003. Um, the system could not recover. Some part of the system were without the energy for two days. Most of them were without any energy for two hours. Big, big blackout we have that day. And the main reason, this, that day was very hot a lot of consumption. The generator were operating at their cap capacity and lines were saturated. So some failure in the system, so like redistributing power through the network, the, the transmission network that overload some lines in the system and created a cascading effect that at the end, we were not able, some generators start getting out of the system. At the end, we were not able to balance the load. Frequency just went crazy that day. This is a picture of what happened. As you can see here, 20 hours before the blackout, seven hours after the blackout. And we can see the difference in the, in the map. You can see the lights here. Um, and you can see, for example, this long island here, it's still in dark. So that day after seven hours, they still didn't have any electricity here in Long Island. And some of their part were Toronto, which is still in dark. Right? So this was a very serious and, and, and big blackout we had. So as I said, the system is large, it's complex, and also subject to uncertainties. So it's very, hard to deal with a system like this because 
of the size, complexity, and certainty, but we need to, we cannot put this in the lab. So we need to have a good model that can describe the behavior in the system and try to get a good accurate description of what might happen. So we need models for this. So we have just two more minutes. Um, with the, with the, as, as David mentioned, so the, the system is moving into adopting more renewable energy sources. But those became very different from the conventional power plant, the few synchron generators. So one of the immediate concerns that we have is whether the system will be robust enough to deal with changes in the power. We want to keep this a perfect balance. But now, if the generator is not as robust, we call it inertia. And here you have a basic equation that might describe that. This is the angular frequency, 2 pi f. f is the frequency in the country, 60 hertz. So this is 2 pi f. And the equation is that one. This is a generated power, a consumed power. If there is any different, then the frequency will change in the system. But if the inertia in the system is getting smaller and smaller, then these changes will get larger. So that's a, a very simple equation that can describe that, that, that issue that we have. So as we move to a different way to generate power, not with synchronous generators, inertia will be smaller in the whole system. The system will be less robust and keeping this at perfect balance will be harder. And because the, the time is, we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you to go through this slide and click at this uh, slide. You will see a video. Please look at the video and see the response. And here you have another one, different behavior. Look at the behavior. This is the frequency at different measure, at different point of degree. Look at the behavior. The frequency is always around 60 hertz. But in this case, the frequency had a big jump here. But look at the two and compare. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, help me with the, this course. Spread the word. Uh, if we can get more students, we may be able to get a TA. That will be useful for everyone. Yeah. And on Wednesday, we will see this experiment. Yeah. Thank you, guys. See you on Wednesday.